We'll bring the two star majors up and let them talk real quick, and then we'll be followed by Patrick. I'm uh, I'm Command Sergeant Major Bradshaw from One Fury. Uh, I've been asked to speak on a recent exercise that we went on, Swift Response 21. Uh, so Swift Response uh, is a annual exercise conducted by uh, United <coughs> States Army Europe. Their uh, their primary goal in Europe is to uh, strengthen the alliance, increase interoperability with our with our allies and our partners, and uh, deter Russian aggression. So, ultimately, what what we were tasked to do was execute a direct direct delivery airdrop into Estonia, conduct about seventy two hours of uh, of operations, and then transition to conducting live fires for for about a week for the battalion. So. We took, uh, we took our Alpha Company, our Bravo Company, uh, our staff from our HHC, and, uh, and then our uh, sustainment company, our forward support company. And then we had a company from uh, two para, uh, British, a British regiment. Uh, so the Brits actually arrived about two weeks prior to us uh, executing the exercise. And we, we had to progress them through, uh, through airborne operations because they really have not done much because of COVID. Their country has been locked down pretty much since the start. So none of them had jumped in, in almost two years. So uh, we took the time while they were, while they were on Fort Bragg to, to kind of build, uh, build a relationship with them. So we, we did some PT competitions where we paired one of our, one of our paratroopers with one of theirs and then uh, did a lot of a lot of the events in the new Army Physical Fitness Test, and then ran out to one of the ranges, and then we shot. We were going to shoot their weapons, but they didn't have they didn't have uh, the the rounds in uh, in Fort Bragg for us to do that. So we uh, we had them shoot our weapons, and then we we ran back and then gave an award to to the winning team, um, and then. Uh, we went into conducting airborne operations on Fort Bragg for about a week with the with the British paratroopers, uh, and then, in order for us to actually execute the operation, we went straight from Fort Bragg and uh, conducted conducted an airdrop into uh, just outside of Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, so that's about an 11-hour flight. So we executed a. Uh, uh, in-flight rig on C-17s, and if anybody's done an in-flight rig, you know that, that is not the, the most uh, the most fun thing to do. But uh, we really really not many issues. Uh, we uh, conducted our 11-hour flight about four hours out. We we began donning parachutes and then checked everybody. Uh, we dropped we dropped I believe it was seven pieces of heavy equipment. Push door bundles out of the uh, first two aircraft in the train, and then exited uh, almost a thousand paratroopers onto uh, onto a drop zone in Estonia. And then uh, on the drop zone, there was a there was a fairly large trench line. And in in my battalion, we like to we like to train our guys to fight to assemble, not assemble and then fight. So we had paratroopers from from across the battalion linking up with the uh, with British paratroopers and then uh, clearing about 350 meters of trench line and then pushing out into a defense. Uh, we remained we remained in that defense overnight and then uh, prepared for a battalion air assault the next day. If you're not familiar with where Estonia is at, it's in Northern Europe. It's, it's pretty much on the same parallel as, as Alaska. So even though we conducted this in May, there was a there was a big difference from going from 85 degrees and sunny in uh, in North Carolina to about 30 degrees and raining in in Estonia, and then uh, the training area in Estonia was not um, the, the elevation was not very good. So we uh, we ended up being in in a swamp for about uh, for about. 24 hours after we uh, after we conducted our air assault, so we conducted the battalion air assault in in four turns. I went to the south with our Bravo company, and our battalion commander went to the north with uh, with the British Paris and and our Alpha company. Pretty sure he went to the north because that was the drier area. Um, so, uh, 
<laughs> it does. Um, so uh, after we conducted the aerosol, we moved we moved to uh, three different low water crossings in order to secure a route for an armored British element to conduct a uh, forward passage passage lines through our element. Um, when we talk about interoperability, it, it becomes it becomes quite a challenge because our radios are not necessarily combat compatible with their radios. So we have to uh, we have to look at different ways to to be able to communicate and be able to operate with uh, with with other nations that we that are either our allies or our partners. Um, normally we overcome that we overcome that by by taking one of our paratroopers and putting them in their formation with one of our with with one of our radios and then taking the uh, Taking our taking someone from our allies or our partners and then putting them in our formations with their radios. Uh, I don't think this is something that will ever be fixed because every nation has a uh, a monetary investment in their in producing their own equipment in their own country. But I, I think I think it is easy to it's easy to integrate with with our partners and allies because we all operate generally off the same doctrine. So it's it's actually fairly easy to, to fight alongside them. It becomes, it becomes more difficult in the technical aspects, that reporting procedures and stuff like that. But uh, overall, we, we, uh, we, had, we really had little issue uh, conducting, that, conducting that exercise. Um, we did have a few cold weather injuries walking through, walking through a waist deep swamp in, in 30 degree water, but it, uh, it all it all came out okay in the end, and then after that, uh, our battalion transitioned over to conducting live fires. Europe is a great place to train because they really don't care what you do, as long as you're there. As long as there's as long as there are people there with a with an American flag on their shoulder, the Europeans, especially in the Baltic countries, are extremely excited to have us and they want to keep us happy because we are, you know, in in where we were at in Estonia, we were about a hundred miles from uh, Saint Petersburg in Russia, so there were. Uh, they're obviously very happy for us to be there, um, and they are. Uh, so, their training area is is wide open and easy to easy to operate in, and their range restrictions are far less restrictive than anywhere in the United States. So, we were able to conduct some really good live fires there. Uh, we were able to integrate all of our weapon systems, and uh, we want to train our battalion to lead with HE. So, we we uh, conducted numerous. Uh, Numerous, numerous live fires were at the squad level. We were throwing live hand grenades, uh, firing, firing uh, the Carl, Carl Gustav at bunkers, and then we conducted a support by live fire, uh, a support by fire live fire, uh, integrated with a walk and shoot. So our uh, our lieutenants had an opportunity to echelon fires from uh, 155 down to 81 millimeter mortars, and then. Uh, we we emplaced a support by fire and then had had our had our elements maneuver within 15 degrees of our machine guns and within 45 within 45 degrees of a uh, of an AT shot out of a 84 millimeter recoil, recoilless rifle. Um, so it was a, it was a good time, especially watching the lieutenant's um, <laughs> hesitation in, in moving across the uh, in moving across the objective. Because 15 degrees, when there's 7.62 coming in front of you, it feels a lot closer than it than it actually is. Um, yeah. So, you know, pending any questions, I'll be followed by Sergeant Major Hart. From Thank you. For those of you who haven't met, I'm Charlie Harp. I'm the 2508 CSM. Um, Starting out, uh, COVID kind of shaped a lot of our deployment. Immediately, it knocked it off, uh, knocked off two months from it, um, delaying the people that were coming home, and then also delaying our uh, deployment out. Uh, we started out with a 14-day quarantine at Five Patriot on Fort Bragg. Just imagine tent city in a gravel pit. Um, I did have pictures. We can put them up later. Um, so quarantine had its ups and downs. Uh, having to stay in tents, eat okay food uh, for two weeks prior to a deployment. <laughs> Uh, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, it allowed the boss and I to kind of get the opportunity to get to know a portion of the battalion a little bit better. So overseas, COVID threat remained. In the first month, I ended up getting a little sick and got immediately put into a 14-day quarantine, more of an isolation, uh, which was horrible. Uh, that was probably the worst part of my deployment. 
Um, and, and, then, and I didn't even test positive for COVID. I was just like had the flu or something. I don't know if that's even still a thing anymore. Uh, and then a while later, Colonel Bell actually got COVID. Uh, and because I was just in close contact with him, because we're a command team, uh, they put me back in quarantine for another 14 days. So on top of those two quarantines and the other one, my first half of the deployment was about 40 days worth of sitting in a tent by myself, which is very frustrating. Uh, probably have PTSD from that. Um, so, and then, you know, and just to wrap up the COVID stuff, even as we left theater, it still kind of presented a threat. We ended up shutting down the PX and the barbershop. Um, just, you know, because if anyone got COVID while we were on our way back, that would essentially take out that entire chalk and make them sit in Kuwait uh, for at least three, two or three weeks. And uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Um, and the whole barbershop thing, that kind of created a little bit of uh, friction as we returned and looked at All-American 9 in the face as we got off the bird, but there was a reason behind it. So we just wanted to get everybody home. Uh, so basically, our mission consisted of base defense and security force responsibilities at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Uh, two Fury took active measures to protect coalition personnel and equipment in an ongoing fight against Daesh. Um, the evolving mission set ended up spreading our battalion across there in Iraq, Syria, and Kuwait. Uh, the majority of our battalions stayed in uh, Al-Assad. Uh, providing perimeter security, security and enabled uh, the targeting of Daesh. Uh, the required integration across the Air Force, Marines, partner nations uh, like Norway, Germany, Poland, Spain, we really worked with Norway the most, um, all enabling the accomplishment of the mission. Our Charlie company integrated uh, tightly with the Norwegian platoon and actively patrolled the Iraqi, or excuse me, and actively patrolled with Iraqi elements in the uh, Amber Zone. Uh, we were never actually allowed to leave. Um, yeah, that's part of the Norwegian games. And then uh, as operational needs arose, our mission set expanded as we established a company-sized reserve force in Kuwait and supported special operations in Syria. Um, the battalion's support of these missions provided the theater with the operational flexibility while maintaining a deterrent uh, to hostile actors. Uh, so what does that mean? Our guys sat in towers most of the time. Uh, it wasn't uh, the most exciting uh, deployment like uh, Colonel Browning's, um, but it was what it was. 24-hour um, security over eight months, uh, controlled the flow of traffic in and out of the base, searching and clearing hundreds of vehicles a week, um, revamped the entire base security plan and made vast improvements uh, at every guard tower and the entry control point. Um, and that may not sound like much, but it meant a lot to about the 5,000 or so people that live and worked at Al Assad. Um, and our, and our, our guys did an incredible job. Um, Colonel Bell was also the forcing function and what I would call the shadow commander of all of Al-Assad. Uh, other people like to think they were in charge of that, but I think it was him. Um, we established a combined joint operations center that currently did, did not exist prior to, uh, completely gutted a building and recreated it, uh, bringing in all the elements in one spot and really synchronizing all the assets across the base, which they absolutely were not prior to. Uh, most of the time they didn't have accountability of everyone on the base. So, uh, training, we got lots of trigger time. You can see a lot of that, little AT4 shoot, mortar shoots. Um, part, of, part of the security that we were able to, to provide for the base was really just doing live fires. So anyone surrounding didn't have the idea of attacking. Um, all they heard was just constant live fires. AC-130 gunship live fires, mortar live fires. Uh, we fired, what was it? The first three months, half a million rounds. Yeah, and I think it was every mortar round in theater. That, that was available at the time. Um, so we got lots of training in that aspect. And then there was one, uh, one sweet spot where uh, we had some intel that there was uh, some fighters hanging out in a cave somewhere that were talking about attacking. And uh, due to all the live fires, uh, I think some of the chatter that we, or some of the feedback that we got from them, uh, what was that quote? It was like, we cannot attack the base. The Americans will erase us from the earth. <laughs> so uh, so they, they had pulled out some 107s to attack the base. Uh, we had intel from a source that was in it, and the AC-130 squadron was working really well with us. They went up and did a live fire, and we had the mortars do live fires over towards the area where they were staging. And the feedback from the source was, if we fight from the, from the ISIS or the Daesh commander, if we shoot a single bullet, the Americans will erase us from the earth. Yeah. And you don't have to pick up brass over there, obviously. <laughs> Not at all. Don't let that in. You know, CSMs have a heart attack out there. Just training in the chapel. He's brave. 
that was the Spanish bird, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit of training with some Spaniards. A couple great Hollywood shots. Yeah. Bravo Company command team. We can give you copies of all these if you'd like. <laughs> A lot of them are all on our, uh, on our Facebook page. If you, if you, if you pay really close attention, they are in uh, oh, yeah, Hawaiian t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> it's not <laughs> perfectly timed mortar live fire and re-enlistment ceremony. And so to your, you mentioned having a, a supply guy who can, who can get things. Um, our ammo sergeant took over the OIR ammo account at one point because we were shooting 90% of the ammo in theater. Um, uh, so real quick, kind of a tangent from the um, uh, deployment. Uh, so we don't we don't have a lot of swag or history or memorabilia over at Two Fury. One Fury <coughs> got most of that stuff to include the regimental colors. But anyway, um, so we've been trying to collect some stuff over time, and we were lucky enough uh, after Rock Pass to get his display case out of his living room, um, and now that's sitting in uh, our battalion headquarters. And then we have pieced together uh, some some other stuff up top. That Doughboy helmet uh, came from him, as well as one of his plaques. Uh, the mugs, me and the boss have found a couple of those on eBay. Um, they're 508 mugs, allegedly from the 40s, um, that was made by a German Stein company. Um, I don't know how true that is as far as the timing, uh, but we bought them anyway. It's true. Um, it is true. So we've been finding them. Uh, the cheapest one for about 50. I found another one for about 250 bucks. But so we got those and donated them. One sitting in brigade headquarters, and then and then in there, uh, another captain purchased that uh, top. Uh, he wouldn't tell us how much or where he got it, but a captain from White Devils, or excuse me, White Falcons, uh, bought it and gave it to us. And it's got some of the parachute. And allegedly, that was jumped into Mark Garden, Market Garden uh, with a 508 paratrooper. Uh, and then really down the bottom, some of his license plates he had in his garage. And then we've got some other stuff. We're just trying. I just wanted to get this up and out there uh, so the guys could see it. I think it's a great way. I'm gonna put up a little plaque on the side that kind of explains where the case came from, just because I, I think that adds a little, yeah. adds a little to it. Now I have one of those at my house. What Chris bought it for me. Uh, you know, it's a okay. sweet talk man. Yeah, because it's Bob Chisholm. Oh yeah, Bob Chisholm. 2013. Is that the last? And it's Kane. The corporal jacket. Yes. I did leave a blue blue falcon coin in there just because. Oh, yeah, this is our memorial wall. Um, I'm looking to add all the casualties um, from World War II. I don't know that I'll be able to get all the pictures in there, but at least the list of names, <coughs> like, um, and the list that I was sent, uh, some historian hooked me up and, and sent me a pretty good list. Uh, but it has like, descriptions on how people died. Um, you know, like stuck head up and got shot in face. You know told not to go into trench, got stabbed. Like, it's, it's, it's very interesting things to kind of read down and, and adds a lot of flavor, I think, to the, uh, to the history of it. But I'm gonna try to get that framed up real nice and kind of add that uh, to the wall. What happened to the mosaic with the KIAs? That, we have yeah, two. We have, we have, yeah, we have two of those. Well, uh, one's in the barracks and one yeah. is in the uh, headquarters. Yeah, rock, back. Oh, well, it's nice enough to give that up. You guys have it on digits? <laughs> you guys have on digits? On digits? Mm. I have it. Oh, do you? Oh, nice, yeah. And then this is one of the last pictures um, from the Two Fury visit uh, to Rock's house uh, awesome. before his health really got bad. What? Um, so, well, closing up the history piece. So what I've been working on, uh, I've seen this stuff in, in lots of um, battalions uh, that I've been in, in the past. You've got a whole wall of prior commanders and prior CSNs. Uh, when I got here, there was not even a list of all the commanders or CSMs from Two Fury, um, which I found odd. And I've been the whole past year. I've, I'm about 
85, 90% complete with pictures and names. Uh, but I have gaps in the 50s for commanders. And from like 64, I think, to 89 for the CSMs. Um, so put your feelers out there if you could and hit me up if anyone has any kind of history or someone to talk to. Um, I've, I've reached out to probably 60, 60 different contacts uh, to try to find this information because it's the last thing I do uh, before I give up the, uh, the battalion. I want that stuff on the wall or as much as I have on the wall um, just to try to keep that history going. So at the end of the day for the deployment, we spent eight months deployed where complacency was one of our biggest threats. Uh, the hard part was convincing the paratroopers that we didn't need a firefight in order to be successful. Um, but we had zero casualties from combat, zero casualties from accidents, and zero casualties from suicide. None of the guys came home with a CIB, but they all came home. And if that isn't a successful deployment, I'll turn in my airborne wings. Absolutely. That's all I got. If you have any questions, um, you can ask that guy.